I was told at that moment that the entire crew of the battalion command were killed. Actually, it did, didn't happen that way. They were wounded. The driver was killed because that Panzerfaust, he still had his head out. And that Panzerfaust explosion killed him instantly. December 7th, 41, I was 16 year old facing another year of school. Now I had friends as young as that get permission from their parents and volunteer to go to war. But my dad said, Jim, please stay there. They will get you soon enough. My dad had been a Navy man in World War I and I couldn't ignore that plea. So I finished my school and then hadn't turned 18 when I graduated because my birthday was in August. So he had asked me, they'll tell you when they want you. And so when I got the invitation, then I said, Pop, I've been invited to go. He said, well, we can't fight that. At that time, we were bumping our nose on the Siegfried line. Lost our ballot battalion commander almost the first day I was there. They managed to shoot his head off with an 88. Terrible. But uh, things just rolled along. The first officer I had who did go through that incident he took command out there on the hillside when the battalion commander was killed. His name was Captain Comfort. And I mentioned him because I had come to know him as an individual and I, I thought worlds of him. He was good. He had walked into this town of Hurlesheim and he said, you guys park right here by that forest because he says, I can't get this tank all the way into town. There's defensive guns up there. But he says, I'm gonna walk in. And that's the last day I saw him because he walked in, but he didn't walk out. He was taken prisoner. Sitting just on what I guess was the south side of Munich. And while I'm sitting there, and I was kind of lounging on the back deck of the tank and I heard the engine of a light plane crank off. There was like a hedgerow on my, my right. And within a minute or something like that, here come this light plane just high enough for me to see him over that hedgerow. And I had practically the 50 caliber on that tank at my back. I just picked it up, cocked it, whirled it over there and started firing at that point. And I watched three of my tracer bullets go into the cowling of the engine and the gun died. And I had a preacher tell me afterwards, well, Jim, it wasn't his day. God didn't want you to bring him down and I'll be plagued the rest of my life wondering which one of Hitler's henchmen managed to get away. We were a crew of four, basically without a command officer. And uh, when that first 88 shell breathed in front of my nose, I dropped my seat and went covered. But the driver did not. And he's really only just fortunate that none of that flack came off of that 
high explosive explosion. And so he, w he got away wounded, but uh, when that tank leaped off the road and stopped terribly abruptly, I never understood that. I, uh, I told, like I took command and it was just like God put words in my mouth. They said, don't sit here because that gunner can load another AP and put it through this thing just because you know he knows you're still there. And so I told him, I said, we're gonna get out of here, hands and elbows, knees and elbows, and we're gonna try to crawl around this hill and get back to our troops. Well, it didn't make it because our loader was wounded out there on the field because they tried to machine gun us while we were out there. But being down, like I had told them, get down and use your basics, knees and elbows, it were pretty hard to hit down there off the hug in the ground. But they did manage to put a shell through his shoulder. All of a sudden, I was, had a pair of black boots in front of my nose because I was leading. And I followed up the black boots to a Tommy gun and the German S3 officer standing there. And he said, surrender, Americans, you're my prisoners. And good old slang, I answered it, you sure as hell got that right. <laughs> so we were, we were prisoned overnight. And uh, just because we had just run on these people, practically unprepared for us, you know, I have talked with people back in that town. And they said, this was an anti-aircraft outfit with these 88s. They were supposed to be shooting up in the air, but they got the order. There's a tank column coming. Lower those guns and stop those tanks. They did. <laughs> they did pretty good. And uh, so during the night, they just abandoned us. So come daylight, I heard our infantry working their way in. It's all opened the door and I said, there's nothing but Americans in here. Then a soldier came up and he said, well, we've cleared it up to here, so you can go back out the way you came in. And that's clear. And going back out, I saw the battalion command tank with a big Panzerfaust gash in the front end of it. And that's all I knew at that moment. But my tank was next, so it came to that in the final drive gear, right in front of my toes on the right hand side of the tank, had a Panzerfaust hole in it like so. That's why the tank stopped just like it had brakes. I blasted the track off of one side, but that tank would have rolled. It would have rolled. And I often wondered why until when I saw that, I had the answer. That Panzerfaust locked that gear immediately and it was just like X. But anyhow, I think we did the right thing and I did the right thing to take charge and get them out of there. When we got back to headquarters, I would practically celebrate it for being alive <laughs> and bringing some troops with me. And uh, so uh, I was told at that moment that the entire crew of the battalion command were killed. Actually, it did, didn't happen that way. They were wounded. The driver was killed because that Panzerfaust, he still had his head out. And that Panzerfaust explosion killed him instantly. But it wounded both of the officers in the turret of the tank. So they were hauled off. But I was even told that the Germans gave them first aid as well as they were able to. And of course, after that also, I had my experience with Dachau. By then being the driver for the accessory officer, he would often have what I called a small command 
a company of tanks and we would go out and reconnoiter areas that had been covered. And so we were doing that one day. We were tooling up across along one of these practically single line roads and he got a phone call and he said, Lieutenant said, I don't know what we've run into, but it's strange. He said, I'm seeing nothing but barbed wire fence. And so he told him, he said, scoot your tanks, it's hard right so I can get past and well, I'm coming up. And he told me, he said, Jim, take us up to the front and see what we got. And when I got there, here was this prison fence system, about 25 foot tall, and a sign above it said Dachau. Well, I'm not sure I'd even heard of Dachau at that moment, but it stuck in my brain as soon as I saw it. And he immediately said, put this tank through that fence. That fence wasn't made to hold a Sherman tank and we went right through it. <laughs> and immediately inside of that fence, I realized I was looking at a whole stack of human bodies, practically bone. <clears throat> Right alongside of it was a concrete building. And just on the other side of the concrete building was a railroad train. And it just ended right there. It just a siding that train could get in there. And I'm not sure at that moment I realized where we were, but that stack of bodies and while these was officer had jumped off the tank and he tried to go get in that building. I don't know how far he got, but here come like one of those skeletons actually walking towards me. And I was panicking because I said, yes, I got food. I got water on this tank. Thank the Lord. Somebody took it out of my hands. <clears throat> I would have killed him immediately if I'd have given him anything like that. Well, he tired and he could not, got, could not get all the way to me. About that time, the captain came back, called on a tank, and he said, Jim, let's get out of here. I've called for the a, uh, medics. And he said, I've been told we don't belong here, so we're leaving. And so I backed the tank out alongside the fence, and we went on down the fence line. And I, that had been quite a day for us. Memoirs of World War II. Thank you for watching this episode of our series, Conversations with a Veteran. We are dedicated to reaching as many World War II veterans as we can before they are no longer with us, but we cannot do it alone. If you'd like to help us in this mission, consider supporting us on Patreon and visit memoirsofworldwar2.com for more information. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out our short film series where we feature a different veteran story every month. In these short documentaries, you get to hear from the veterans themselves in an emotional and visceral way. Seeing the sights and hearing the sounds that they experienced as they fought to bring an end to the greatest conflict that the world has ever seen. Again, thank you for watching and sharing these videos and thank you for your support.